it's Tuesday night, it's cheese night, and I can't find my own face. Now that just doesn't sound good, does it? So let's get rid of the branding and start talking cheese. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I don't know if uh, you're out there. I sent out a very incorrect tweet today saying that I already had this fantastic conversation with Catherine, which obviously is a complete manure. Yeah. Um, that just goes to treat me to try to do things in advance of being Anna when I'm clearly so much better at just winging it. Okay, so a little bit about the Academy. You all know the Academy of Cheese. The Academy of Cheese is the leading cheese training organization, maybe, in the world ever. That's not just me saying. We have at least three other people who agree with me. Um, and uh, we've had a very good summer, and we're just kicking on. It's a second uh, interview we've had. We've got Catherine Mead. Mead. Now, Catherine Mead is a fantastic individual. She's built up her cheese-making company, Line of Dairies, to bring um, uh, artisan and large production cheeses into both the supermarkets and all across the deli in the UK, which makes her a rare beast of being a mid-sized family business uh, that is both doing well and creating new and artisan products. So let's meet her. All right, Catherine, are you ready? I know, put your glass of wine down. I can see it. Here we go. Okay. Hello. How are you? Very well indeed, Charlie. How are you? Extremely fine. Extremely fine. So uh, how, where are you? Is that a very sort of dark I'm, I'm Tonight I'm actually in uh, near Newquay, um, but I live in Falmouth down in West Cornwall. I wake up every morning to the sunrise over the harbour, looking at the sea and over on the headland over at Roseland, where I can see um, the fields of cows and um, sheep. And then I wend my way over to the dairy, which is about five minutes drive away in a very rural part of Cornwall known as Stidians. And um, we're surrounded by trees, woods, um, and mm, probably not much else in truth. Um, and I it gets a bit wet down there on occasion. We have 52 inches of rain a year, which is probably about four times as much as you have on the west coast, east coast of England. So, yeah, oh. we, we're, we're pretty damp. I've driven through there many times. It's very beautiful. You go down these little dells and the streams are coming down. You get the thick hedges and the fields on the hills. Um, it is very beautiful. It must be good pasture. It's really good pasture. And Cornwall, um, th that part of Cornwall has um, a lot of what they call grade two dairy land. So this is permanent pasture, permanent grass lays. And um, we're, it's the best kind of land for um, dairy production. And our climate favours being out from mid March, maybe even earlier if we're on a you know on a good season, and we may bring the cows in again uh, in November. So we have a very long and extended grazing season, which means that most of our milk comes from grass. And through mm -hmm. the winter, of course, we're feeding silage. So it's a really um, perfect environment for dairy and for um, making, get, producing milk for cheese. Yeah, I was, I was talking to Mary Quick, who's, who's a bit north of you. You're probably the only person who is south, though, well, not many. And she was saying that, um, you know, you're bringing your cows in for maybe eight, ten weeks, you know, really not very long at all. Yeah, you can keep them out for a fair time. I mean, it just depends on, um, it does depend on wind and rain. So we can keep them out in the cold and, and you could feed them hay or you can feed them silage outside. But um, it's when it gets particularly wet. Because apart from anything else, you're churning up your fields and therefore you're, you're, you're cutting up next year's food. But, um, yeah. you know, we do have a very long extended grazing season. It's a warm climate. But it is terribly wet, but wet wet uh, climates grow good grass. So, you know, there's a swing and a roundabout in that. Okay, well, we've just got a comment in from James. He loves your cheese, and he obviously loves the NHS as well. Um, your cheeses are, um, they're iconic. Now, I, I want to come back to them because you've got your new kid on the block, the Cornish Kern, tasting tonight. Tasting tonight. Tasting tonight. Um, <laughs> but as, as much as we love your awesome products, um, you're also... Uh, of the Specialist Cheese Makers Association, which is like both the sort of flagship and lifeboat for all the all the small cheese makers of the UK. It's um, the Specialist Cheese Makers Association is an amazing organisation. It's a membership organisation, um, and we have three hundred cheese making members. Um, 
I think the thing that is so special about the Specialist Cheesemakers um, Association and indeed the Specialist Cheesemaking um, sector, let's say, is it's so entirely collegiate and supportive. And we don't see each other as competitors, we see each other as friends. And, and that sounds corny and it sounds trite, but there is so much gain from um, supporting one another in endeavours that can be incredibly trying and incredibly difficult. And there are moments when I, I would doubt that there is a cheesemaker who has not felt the deepest depths of despair in making cheese and the highest stages of elation when it goes right. But cheese has this, uh, has is, is such an organic process and it just goes left field when you least expect it. And sometimes um, the, the, the conundrums and the challenges, are, you know, are beyond Sherlock Holmes and, and being able to, as a cheesemaker, go into your membership organisation and say, help, what on earth am I going to do with this? This has become such an intractable problem. So we are very supportive. We're very, um, in, it, you know, we, we're, we're a real collective and we don't see each other as a threat. We see each other as, as um, we, we enhance the organisation. The more of us that are there, the more contributions, the better and the stronger we are as an organisation. And I think to that end, we're seeing that when we get into um, those really very serious arenas of policy and government, because they're taking us seriously now. They take us really seriously yeah. because they see how well we work together. And um, we're very connected to our raw materials, to farming. Um, many of us are farmers and producers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we um, engage in, in a, a really positive way both in terms of the agricultural environmental side, but also in the um, food safety, you know, food standards side. Yeah, I, I don't want to get into it tonight, but the um, the issues around raw milk are, are forever popping their head up and needing to be addressed as people learn more and more about it's, it's, uh, the challenges of, of handling it, but also the opportunities that it provides. I think we've we've worked so hard in the last twenty years at really um, bringing every the, the 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 policy writers, the opinion leaders, uh, the champions together on the for the case for raw milk and why um, why it is um, it adds so much breadth and diversity to the cheese offer. You know, that, mm -hmm. that's why we have so many amazing, great cheeses. And tonight we're going to taste some cheese. Three out of my four are raw milk. Mm -hmm. And um, that's that's not by way of saying I think raw milk cheeses are better than pasteurized cheeses. Mm -hmm. But I think that raw milk cheese brings an extra dimension, um, an additional dimension, and gives us that much greater diversity. Right. And I believe that we have. Um, really been able over the last, as I say, 20 years to develop our thinking, develop our understanding and to bring people with us. And I think our, our raw milk cheesemakers would not feel the threats that they probably would have done 20 years ago um, mm -hmm. from policy that was possibly going to start clamping down on raw milk yeah. cheese in the way we've seen in the US and in Australia. But, yeah. um, and that's partly, not totally, but it's partly because we're very organized as an association and we are looking at continuous improvement and so, continuous so, understanding. So you're a supporter of cheese rights. And that's, you know, you're cheese, right. lobby cheese group. equality. Cheese yeah, cheese rights mm. and cheese equality, you know? Oh. And we, yeah, we're right behind it, yeah. All right. Well, um, you've chosen cheese tonight. You have chosen from uh, Cumbria. We've got Winyeats, sometimes known as Felston. Um, we've got two from Julie Cheney uh, at Suffolk, um, as, as St. Jude and St. Syrah. And you've got your own Cornish Kern. I'd like to leave Cornish Kern to the last, if that's OK. So yep. what, what do you want to bring in? So 
I'm starting with St Jude, which was Julie's first cheese. So Julie is based in Suffolk. She um, is based down, at, I think we pronounce it Bungay, um, Fen Farm, Fen Farm, which is um, a farm where Johnny Crickmore farms um, his Montbelliard. Mm -hmm. And Julie is a fantastic cheesemaker. She's absolutely exceptional. And she is so good at producing um, soft, white rinded raw milk cheeses. These are difficult cheeses to produce at all sorts of different levels, but Julie has absolutely nailed it. And um, she um, has worked with the specialist cheesemakers over many years. But recently, and I picked this cheese partly because it was an example of a project that we did with her. Um, we had an, a recently had an award called the, the Patrons Award. Um, and our patron, um, His Royal Highness, the um, Prince of Wales, um, supported us in developing an award where we could um, help uh, cheesemakers look at their succession planning. So in agriculture generally, we have a concern that there are some real crafts that could in time be lost if we don't have successors coming through. And Julie is working with a cheese young cheesemaker called Blake, and she really wanted to think about how she could remain engaged in the business, but Blake could come Move through. It on. And so the special, through the Patrons Award, we were able to help Julie um, in developing her own thinking and, and for the two of them to work together to, to create a bit of a plan. And um, that is something that more cheesemakers would benefit from. Thinking about. Yeah, um, no, it's true. We look at um, uh, cheesemakers, not just in this country, but in Italy and, uh, and France. And in the old days, it was, you know, just a fact that the children would, somebody from the family would take on what their parents had done for many years. And that's just not happening as it's more profitable to go and be a marketing specialist or financier or something in the big city mm -hmm. and stay around and frankly earn not very much and get up very early and get your fingers dirty and not have many friends being a cheesemaker. Absolutely. And there are many cheesemakers who don't have any natural successes for one reason or another. And therefore they may, may need to look outside the family and if they're looking outside the family, it is trying to find a way that, it, uh, you know, a mechanism for doing that, that um, benefits both parties and ensures longevity for mm. the product. But St. Jude is an absolute corker of a cheese. Um, oh, white, oh, bloomy. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you can see that, but the texture, oh, can I make this focus? Absolutely amazing texture. The texture is got almost like a filament kind of oh, we can, oh, you can focus my thing you can do it it's almost got a filament type texture but when you put it in your mouth you can't feel those filaments at all it descends into just a very um a very creamy kind of paste and what's a better word for it it's um, like a mousse it is it's like a sour cream mousse mm. um and it's got an incredibly light texture and i would even argue it's got even that hint of, of egginess that you get in in mousse if you if you do know what i mean mm. um uh, and the way that the it's come apart, you're just seeing these these uh, these filaments of cheese come across. I don't know another cheese that has this texture. I, I know lots of no. sort of, um, you know, that, that it, it describes itself as a San Marcelin style, but it's not really. It just looks no. like it. No, I think it, it is unto its own. And it's, um, it's, Got it. It takes a sort of um, a slight sort of grassy nuttiness, and this sort of it's so unctuous. It, it feels so indulgent and and so sort of um, it's 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 creamy and it's smooth, but it's not over rich. Um, you just want more. I I've got this piece here. It's going to be as much as I can do not to eat all of it. Well, I, I, I don't have any stretchments. I'm, I'm going to. Um, You're going so, to. I mean, this is box of chocolates in front of the television, isn't it? It is absolutely stunning. 
This is um, a cheese. Now, I'm, I'm told, because I'm not a cheese maker, that raw milk has possibly its strongest expression in these very young cheeses where yeah. the, um, the, the the bacteria can most be shown to be at play, if I can put it that way, with reducing mm -hmm. the flavours and less sense of textures. Um, and you do feel that this cheese is doing that. It is, um, um, uh, it's, it's like, it's a type of cooking with bacteria. You're using the bacteria to engage the cheese on a journey and deliver flavor and texture through it. So everything happened very quickly in these younger cheeses. Um, and um, if I had my glasses on, I could see the date of production on this, which I think this is probably only four weeks, I'm guessing at it. Because um, I haven't got my glasses, so I can't actually see clearly. Um, but I think you're absolutely right that it it's the production. I mean, Julie is a very she she handles her curds so gently and she's so mm, sensitive in this. And it, but, but surely it, this is the really problem with succession it. is that um, her contribution to her cheese is substantial, and that to bring in another person to take her role cannot help but change the cheese, surely. Another person may well um, express it slightly differently, but it doesn't mean to say um, a slight differentiation would be a poor thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it, if in that situation, their cheese making is so united, the two of them, mm -hmm. that actually they're going to be pretty close. You're going to get some changes and variation anyway, because you'll get changes because of the milk from week to week to week to week to week. Mm -hmm. Then you'll get changes because the temperature outside is changing from week to week to week to week to week. Then All you'll get some have changes. A bigger impact on a fresh cheese than some other cheeses. Exactly, and and then you're going to get some changes because the molds are doing something slightly different in your maturing room because your humidity has actually changed, or or your heat or um, Cold has slightly changed. And so when you've conflated all of those different changes together, and then you overlay another cheese maker, you, you, it's amazing that you can get two products that ever taste the same, really. But but I think that they, they come together. And mm. actually, the cheese maker's part in this, in this kind of situation, is such that you will get consistency in your cheeses. Uh, you'll get more consistency between those two cheese makers probably than you will between the seasonality of the milk. Well, I does of course, uh, all what you just said is true, and it is most of the story, but between leaving their farm and getting to me and leaving their farm and getting to you, they've got a bit of character from that part of their journey as well. So, yeah. um, I, you know, I, I have went to my local cheese shop, thank you very much, Fran, uh, Dan Cheese Please and Lewis, um, and, and she, got these in for me today at extremely short notice and I was a bit concerned that this was going to be forced or under ripe or whatever so I'm this is without question what I've got in front of me today is the best St Jude I've ever tasted it's not it's um, absolutely amazing isn't it yeah. um this one uh, you know you're looking at this and going because it's it's just screaming it's like a red light going on oh my god how farmyard is this going to be and it ain't it ain't I mean, you've eaten quite a lot of it um, yeah, give me a chance. I'll finish it. Um, <laughs> to be fair, to be fair, my wife just came in and 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 she nicked some. Um, oh, she's really? listening. She, she will. She, she's listening to it downstairs, and she clearly couldn't resist coming up for uh, going. If it's that good, I need some now. Yeah. So I'm very pleased. Before, very pleased. before now, you finish it. Um, uh, right. Uh, next up, I think you better go to the Sincera because it is it is a different take on the same product. It's a different take on the same chart. Char so. Um, Ju uh, Julie has worked very closely with Neil's Yard Dairy, and um, and they have this fantastic um, spa terminus building, their new building, and um, there's this is um, Sincera is um, a slightly more mature and washed, bloomy rind. So again, have you got some there, Charlie, or not? No, no, no. You, didn't, you didn't send me any. Oh god, it's all my fault. OBE, most important <laughs> cheese person in the country, can't even get me a decent cheese. So, 
You've got to get the right camera. Your camera is going to make it hard for people to see. Okay, I'm going to give it a go. But to be honest, in the box, you're going to see probably on camera very little differentiation. No, no, I can't no. see anything. It looks, no. it looks okay. So we're talking you know, about another little wooden box. This one is totally enclosed. And this is, I suppose in, in texture, it's like a very, very ripe camembert. So you've got a very um, bloomy rind. You've got some, you know, some proteolosis going on, i.e. the rind is breaking down. Under the rind is so, so um, liquid, but the core is still quite hard. And I'm going to eat this bit because it's going everywhere. Oh, and, I've just, oh I've hello. Just, I've, I've just tried to share that. I've gone for mm. the wrong one, okay. Uh, mm. Screen share. Let's get rid of you. And let's see if I can find one oh. for... Uh, um, and let's go for the other one. Let's see if that's any better. Oh, it's just that one again. Okay, let's just get rid of mm. that. So you can see now that. Ooh. Okay, that was it. But it's it, it from the outside. It looks a bit like um, an epoise, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. It's, it's... Uh, yeah, very pale. It's very mm -hmm. pale, and it's um. It's got that lovely nuttiness and very developed flavour. I've got some linens going on in there. And, um, you know, that kind of, you know, that lovely smelly rind. But I love this cheese because some of those smelly rind cheeses deliver really, really hard, heavy on um, aroma, mm -hmm. but not so well on taste. You know, you could yeah, be a little yeah, bit yeah, yeah, totally. You take it to your nose, you take it through all through your nose and the back of your throat and think, wow, this is going to taste you know, amazing. And actually, when it gets to your mouth, you think, oh, hang on, there wasn't so much going on in that one. Whereas mm. this cheese is almost the opposite. So you've got a fantastic mushroomy, celery, little bit as in cellar rather than celery. Mm -hmm. Cellar sort of... Um, dampness humidity but actually that flavor is really really present and so rounded and nutty and um again like st jude really unctuous but a bit more dense than in its pace than st jude but it feels so luxurious it's fantastic absolutely wonderful so this is a cheese is a washed rind cheese would you um does it have any of those sort of meaty elements that you might get on a cheese like this Ti i'm getting a tiny bit but not masses not masses mm -hmm. i um i'm getting i i feel i have more um it's more sort of herbage and and vegetably um and a little bit you know with some nuts and grassiness more of those sort of little bits of cabbage but um it it's just got a sort of just a different dimension to St Jude. And the texture, how's it changed from St Jude? How's the texture moved on? So St Jude is moussey and light mm -hmm. and fluffy and um, a little bit um, uh, striated, whereas yeah, yeah. whereas um, the St Sarah is much has got this sort of like more like a, a you know a really broken down camembert kind of firm in its core and then the rind that's just breaking down gently and gets sort of that runniness under the rind so you get that sort of um uh, you know the, the the two textured feet without getting slip skin or anything like that you've mm. got just a, a really beautiful combination of gooeyness and and a little bit of firmness in the core i'm guessing i imagine it's right that that you leave this to mature longer and it just becomes really seriously gooey throughout and you take it out of this little beautiful little wooden box and it will just walk across your table because this um, is this is an example of the collaboration you're talking about in the fca you've got a cheese made by one member and a cheese brought on by another member another member yeah, um, yeah. And, and and that belief that um uh, creating a new cheese um is 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 a is a team effort you know it's it's something that you can get together and bring something new on there's the skills of affinage which in real terms are sort of newly identified in this country more of a european thingy um yeah and now and now you know in in the in europe affinage is very much thought of as a separate sport 
you know you have the the maker and the and, and the f and, mm. and and bringing that in through the specialist cheesemakers association uh through members like you know neil's yard allows us to develop more cheeses more different types of cheeses yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and yeah. specialisms to appear in our industry that allow the you know which perhaps the cheesemaker themselves doesn't have the skill or the time or or or, or, or the opportunity to develop themselves absolutely absolutely and um i think that also uh, you know a good a, a good affineur um and there aren't that many in this country but the number is growing and so there is mm -hmm. greater interest than we ever had before and you know a really good affineur does um significantly enhance there's so much uplift um from um the more straightforward presentation because they are looking at cheeses and judging when a cheese is right for for certain markets because mm. you know one market doesn't necessarily want the cheese at the same no. point in time as another no. market and no. they no, have the ability to take it on and really sensitively work with that cheese until they get mm. it to just right because this cheese cheese like this would be absolutely classic example they'll be sending it out to some customers who are saying i'd like st jude and st sarah and i'd like to have it with a shelf life of two weeks it'll be here and gone therefore let's keep it because they're going to have it for no time at all where conversely others might say well i'd like it for six weeks in which case you're going to have to get it ready to go and assume it's going to be eaten within uh you know a week of arrival but it's also got to keep performing for six weeks beyond that which is quite a challenge, um, challenge and let's let's really, turn to um now you the so purchase you Wynette. picked out is is win yates win yeah Wynette? so win yates um this is tom and claire no uh uh no but who are up on the edge of cambria uh cumbria and they have been um making a raw milk wensleydale and I think this cheese is fascinating because, again, you're getting so much of the um, the flavour of the grass coming through, the flavour of the herbage. Um, Give me the Let's look at it. So Come back. It's, right, okay. Okay. Can you see that? Just about. So Interestingly, about we've got a bit of we've got a bit of maturing under the rind. Um, this is um, a cheese that ordinarily I would expect to be pretty acid, pretty pretty crumbly, um, and in quite an open texture. And and this cheese is not acid, is not open, um, and it's not crumbly. Um, it's it's a much closer texture. Uh, it breaks very gently, and it's got sort of a softness and ply. It, it's quite pliable. But the interesting thing about it, very, very distinctive flavour. Um, but it's not a flavour that we necessarily associate with um, that very acid Wensleydale that we we meet most normally. So, you know, we're most familiar with. Question: If it doesn't look like a Wensleydale and it doesn't taste like a Wensleydale, why is it a Wensleydale? Because it's made to the recipe of a Wensleydale. So it will be made with this fairly quick acid profile and it will be made um, in the fashion of um, Wensleydale, the original recipe. And mm. it is, a lot of these territorials have many facets to them. They weren't all made in exactly the self same way. I mean, the one we're all very familiar with is Lancashire, you know, where you've got um you know the acid acid lancashire and the, and the soft buttery lancashire and so it was the same with um uh with wensleydale but a, another one you'll be familiar with is the red leicester and mm -hmm. um you know spark and is an extraordinary example of a traditional red leicester made in a traditional way but not the recipe that we're so very used to at the moment it's, um, it's true it's true i I, <clears throat> I always think of myself as a bit of a um uh i think you need to get under the skin of some of these things because it's not enough to use a traditional recipe 
because a lot of the things that we do today aren't traditional. We have fridges, we have um, dairy, um, uh, different hygiene standards, we have different breeds of cattle. I mean, the, the black and whites that, you know, are the majority of the milking herd in the UK weren't introduced into the UK until the 1940s and 1950s. So a lot of the history of our, um, of our cheese making recipes date back to a time when they weren't using the tools we're using today and the ingredients. Mm -hmm. To say with all honesty, we're using something more traditional or something more original than someone else. When we're starting from the base of we're not using the same ingredients, we're not using the same tools. I mean, take, take Red Leicester for an example. Um, you know, I was chatting to um, to to uh, it's, it's Joe David and, Clark. David Clark, and he produced this book about the of, the, of Red Leicester, and he was talking about the grass that he was feeding it. Um, they were feeding Red Leicester back then was a much worse quality of grass, lots of yeah. reed, lots of wet, more sort of quasi meadow pasture rather than the, the high quality pasture that we're feeding, you know, mm. we're feeding today. And any cheesemaker goes on about the fact that the feed is so important. Mm. Um, so, so it is, it is quite difficult, I think, to plot our way back through time to be sure we know what we're talking about. And it seems to me that the SCA has a real resource there to help people understand how their decisions are traditional but also modern yeah absolutely and um <clears throat> i think i think there was a couple of points um some of our territorials have been quite lost and they've been commoditized so we're used to seeing um a style of uh red leicester or carefully or cheshire that comes in um, a vat pack bag and it's made in a big block to a specific recipe. And if you want any of those cheeses, that's the cheese you're likely to get because it, it's the one most widely. At a point in time when um, those cheeses would have been made right across the Wensleydale area or right across the Carefilly mm -hmm. area, um, there would have been huge variation in the cheeses mm -hmm. that were made. They wouldn't all taste it just the same because every uh farmstead that was making the cheese would have had their own take on on you know what tasted good and what they wanted to do so i think yeah i think that this is just getting behind that um the spirit of again diversity diversity and breadth and not all having mm. producing the, the same thing okay okay time to talk about you your cheese Cornish -Kern. the Cornish -Kern. this is an amazing cheese. This is this is um this is all about fusion cheese. You've got you've got a Gouda style. Well, it is slightly. You've got a Gouda style <laughs> wash curd. You're using yeah. Alpine starters. You're using yeah. that buttery West Country milk. You're maturing it in your own um uh, in your own biome. Um, you're mm. using um uh, um one uh, an, um, an, a rind that sort of allows it to breathe, but also blocks out the development mm. of, of mm. molds and and. and so, which is a very modern technology you know they had traditional methods of polypopal rubbing or something but mm. this is so this is this is this is cutting edge technology it's all over the shop really isn't it <laughs> it's, so how did you uh, come up with it it's cheese makers go mad isn't it um mm. well we we started with a gouda recipe and we we really enjoyed the gouda's but we wanted to just shift the flavor profile a wee bit and so, um, and we started experimenting with some of the Alpine, um, the Alpine uh, starter cultures. This this cheese here is um, twenty five months. We we've been working towards trying to get a slightly younger profile, but actually, we're finding that it's just mellowing out and becoming so sort of um sweet and savory so close textured a little bit of crystal development we're getting so much from it at that at that um Thanks extra for sort of four or five months it's really worth hanging on in there it, it feels it, like it, a it, long time to wait for cheese but it's it, but it's two biggest influences in gouda and sort of the mm. alpines they both very much flower at that 12, 14, 16 month period, don't they? They're, they're mm. really, you know, Gouda is arguably the most boring cheese of the world when it's young. I mean, it is the least tasty, 
well, come on, you know what I mean? It's got that kind of elastic, kind of really. It, it's, 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 Johnny, it's, say what you really feel. <laughs> okay. Well, somebody has to be those boring to it, but it comes in as it's a late developer. It's like me. It's like me. You know, <laughs> you didn't want to know me before I was 25. I was I was all over the shop. But at, I'm only 50 next year. I'm coming into my prime, and that's like <laughs> that's my gamble, you know. I'll um I'll bear that in mind every time I'm tasting kernel. Okay. I don't want to ruin it for you. You don't want to ruin it for it, you. It does. It, it has been quite a surprise to us that it does seem to just be getting better and better as it gets older. Mm. So the interesting thing is how far are we going to take it? Um, from a commercial point of view, it's not great having cheese on the shelves. No, no, years. no. I'm pretty um, sure that's true. We we don't really want to work into the world of you know the bank of parmesan, but um, it is really interesting. And people say, you know, people. I think there's a common perception that. Because it's older, it means it's stronger. And actually, if, if stronger means more acid and yeah, stronger yeah, yeah. means a little bit more of a kind of kick at the back of the throat, the cheese has none of those things. But it's just developing that sort of intensity. Um, and you get a sort of much greater, le more levels of complexity through it. So um, we, at the moment, we're feeling it's more interesting at this stage and certainly when we're grading we are just saying no let's hang on let's hang on so um we're doing it to ourselves rather but well well um i mean that just brings us up to, to the point is you got a, the top of the tree the best cheese awards in the world world cheese awards supreme champion with this chap we did Am I right? so I know, can you believe it 17 2017, 2017 yeah yeah absolutely something else isn't it weren't we in and, norway in 2018 oh i can't remember it all fuses into one you say that yeah, your, i think we were in norway their friends do it because they yeah. like each other well i've been drinking with you in all these strange places and i can i can reassure our visitors and our watchers that these people really do like each other except when the previous chair tim jones starts playing poker and then it goes a bit sideways just gonna oh, yeah. say that don't do that um uh Catherine, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. Um, well, it's uh, my pleasure. Your choices have been great. And um, Good. great luck keeping the specialist cheese making as that bright, shining light of cheese knowledge and cheese love that keeps these small cheese makers producing their awesome products. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, thank you on behalf of the cheese members that, you know, for all your support, Charlie. Because through the Academy and the Guild and the World Cheese Awards, you do amazing things. We're really grateful. Sure. To really grateful. Well, let's all let's all feel the love and raise, the keep love. on raising glasses yeah. and, and catches. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much, Catherine. Cheers. Thank you. That was the inestimable, the amazing Catherine Mead OBE. Uh, she is a real shining light. A shining light. It is fantastic to see so such a such a skilled person treading that difficult path of commercial success and fantastic artisan skill. So uh, let's have a quick look forward. Next week, we're exploring the world. We've got a specialist, the uh, South America's only wine sommelier, cool. um, and some South American cheeses from Chile. Uh, and we're going to be talking to a, cheese, a South American cheese specialist as well. So. Having done the best of the British, we are now reaching across all the way down to the South Atlantic and the uh, <laughs> about cheese. So I hope you'll join me next week. Always a Tuesday. Always all of us about cheese. So, and if you need to learn any more about cheese, you'll be pleased to know that I am doing online courses. The level two, we're going to be launching that in November. So if you've done your level one cheese, the Academy of Cheese, and you want to do level T, level two, then my a uh, succinct yet verbose version of teaching is available to you. Uh, love you very much. See you next week. It's been Tuesday night. It's been Cheese Night. <laughs>